My name's Diana Worthy and I'm a Senior Policy Planner at TDC and I manage our Natural Hazards uh, Policy Work Program and that includes being the lead on this Coastal Management Project. Um, first of all, I would also like to extend my warm welcome to you all tonight um, for tuning in to listen to this project. So now I'm just going to give a bit of an overview. So in terms of Tasman's coastline, it spans more than 700 kilometres of open coast and estuary shorelines. And our geography ranges from cliff and rocky landforms through to sand dunes, sandy beaches and sand spits. Like other coastal communities around New Zealand, in our district we have experienced and will continue to experience the impacts of coastal hazards. Ex-tropical cyclone Fahey in 2018 and Drina in 1997 are two examples of coastal storm surges that had significant impacts along our coastline. In addition to this, the effects of climate change will affect us all, and this includes rising sea levels. At Council, we have been using natural hazards and sea level rise information in our decision making processes for a number of years. And this is because the decisions that we make today will affect our children, grandchildren, and future communities. Many of our land use planning, asset and infrastructure decisions have long lifetimes. And so we can see from this slide that things like houses, our infrastructure pipe networks and road infrastructure have asset lifetimes between, 100, between sorry, 50 and 100 years time and decisions around our road corridors and subdivision are permanent. In terms of the Coastal Management Project, we launched this in 2019, and the project aims to enable our Tasman Bay, Te Tai o Aoriri, and Golden Bay, Mohua communities to work towards long-term adaptive planning for coastal hazards and sea level rise. The project's following the MFE guidance on coastal hazards and climate change that was released in 2017. And this guidance sets out a 10-step decision-making process that councils and communities can work together on adaption planning. And the guidance is framed around these five key questions, as you can see on this slide. And we're currently at the process of looking at what can we do about it. I'm now going to Dr. Rob Bell. Kia ora koutou katoa. So my name is Rob Bell and I'm beaming in from the inland port of Hamilton. So just a bit of context, I'm a coastal engineer, been involved in a lot of infrastructure projects around New Zealand. And I was also the lead author on that Ministry for the Environment Coastal Guidance that Diana just described. So just in terms of where we've come from in terms of rising sea levels in New Zealand. So this is a compilation of five of the longest sea level gauge records in New Zealand, back to the 1900s, for four of them anyway. But for Nelson and the Tasman region, uh, the record's only a few decades long, so eventually it, we can splice that in with these other records. Essentially, uh, it, it shows a base rise in the sea level, mean sea level around New Zealand. So the direction of travel, is, is upwards, uh, and that's superimposed on the year-to-year -year variability we get from El Nino to La Nina. The other aspect of this curve is it's I've, I've spliced in the four Ministry for the Environment guidance scenarios for sea level rise just out to 2030. So it's just a little peek into the future, uh, and it overlaps with the measured record. And it shows that we're tracking the modeled and the measured are tracking pretty much uh, in close alignment. So with that rising base sea level, which is now 0.2 metres higher since the 1920s, we're, we're seeing uh, the most obvious impact, which is going to be more flooding. So the picture on the right shows an estuary in the North Island on a sunny day, no storm in sight, but it's a king tide. And so a lot of our estuaries and our coastal areas are brimful 
uh, on these king tides, and that's because the base sea level has risen by that 20 centimetres. We're also seeing more nuisance flooding where we've got car parks, we've got uh, roads that are getting more regularly flooding and causing disruption. And then of course, we're gonna have more extreme events like Fahey, as has been described. The fourth type of flooding we're gonna see um, emerging in the next few decades, and it's already started, is compound flood hazards where we've got combinations occurring together of intense rainfall, perhaps a flooded river. We've got those high tides and a storm surge, and that goes hand in hand with rising groundwater. So just in terms of adaptation and mitigation of emissions, they're two sides of a coin. But with adaptation, it's, got to, it's going to have to be a continual process alongside reducing emissions. So with, with emissions, I've got the tap there on the, on the deep oceans, there's a very long lag between the time emissions turn up in the atmosphere, a long lag between the oceans heating, the polar ice sheets melting, before we see a rise in sea level. So that's a long lag of many decades, if not centuries. So the tap there on the left, we just can't turn the tap off and immediately um, find where we're not overflowing the bath. So the bath, the overflowing bath is a, is a, is a sort of a picture showing we're still gonna have to mop up and do adaptation despite reducing emissions. So we've got to do both. So this rising climate risk is really the new normal we have to get used to. Uh, and that rising risk is driven partly by the past and ongoing development in the hazard prone land. So we've got more valuable buildings and infrastructure. We're seeing, we're gonna see more frequent coastal hazards and the, the higher consequences from that. And it means the past events and our records are not going to be a reliable guide for the future risk because of that rising risk. So we have to think differently about how to manage that ongoing changing risk. And we have to ask ourselves the question, do we continually react, clean up and stay put after events? Or do we protect assets and hunker down? Well, maybe for a while anyway. Or do we anticipate and adapt as conditions change? So can we be adaptive and work with the uncertainty that I'll show you shortly with sea level rise? Can we do timely investment, not too soon or not too late, the Goldilocks sort of principle. Um, and it's gotta be relative to some kind of threshold at a local level. And then land use planning, we need to put the brakes on that rising risk so we're not making things worse uh, down the track. So these are the four sea level rise scenarios in the Ministry for the Environment guidance. The bottom one, the green one, is where we have severe curbs on global emissions. So that's sort of equivalent to the Paris Agreement one where we're trying to limit the global temperature below two degrees, if not one and a half. The top one is continuing high emissions and ice sheet, polar ice sheet instabilities. And then we've got a couple of scenarios in between. So you can see as it's as, as we get into the latter part of the century and beyond, this widening uncertainty. So if we have a local area, for instance, in the Tasman region that might have a adaptation threshold where we've got to do something by the time sea level rise gets to 0.8 meters. So if we, if we just assume this threshold for this example, then there's a whole 100 years when that particular sea level rise might turn up. So at the earliest, if we have this continuing high emissions, you see the left-hand star, that's where we might sort of go hard and go early and say, well, maybe the worst case, let's plan and put an option for the worst case. The other stars might be the most likely or the best estimate, and then we've got the Paris Agreement one. So there's a whole 100 year window when we could do something. Even at 0.4 meters threshold, we're a slightly low, lower line. We might have a whole 40 years when we can do something. 
uh, so if we monitor and adapt when we when we need to. So an adaptive approach is best rather than conventionally where we've done a few predictions, run a model, and then just chose the best case and then act on it. So why do we use adaptive planning and design? Well, we can't second guess what sea level rise we're going to get beyond 2050. But on the other hand, decisions have to be made soon under conditions of that uncertainty and the changing risk. And that's going to persist over long time frames of centuries. So this adaptive approach fits that problem space well uh, of a changing risk where we don't know how quickly it will change. And it also an adaptive approach helps mediate different values and preferences. So if we don't have to adapt straight away, then we can build in the preferences for today's generation as well as future generations. But if we don't do that, we can just perpetuate a response that we stick with despite the need to change tack down the track. So when do we use adaptive planning and design? Well, it's, it's around considering what that locally relevant adaptation threshold is and then looking at it across the range of sea level rise scenarios. So is it at an imminent threshold? Is it 0.4 meters of sea level rise? Is it 0.8? For existing developments, we can look at those and pre-plan alternative options or pathways to switch over time. And so Diana is going to go through some of those options. Uh, just as an example, in the infrastructure space, we might have a road that at 0.4 metre sea level rise is at a threshold. And so we could raise the road, the coastal road, it might be a coastal access road. We could raise it, but that at 0.8 of a metre, we might have to do manage retreat of that road. So the two options there are a sequence that we could look at. So that's adaptive plan. For new developments in infrastructure, we need to ask the question, can we avoid that risk? Can it be sequenced? Or eventually, can we repurpose that infrastructure? So just to wrap this up, there's been a recent update from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And part of that was some reassessment of global sea level rise numbers. So I've, I've replotted the MFE coastal guidance, which are the four scenarios I showed you before. And the crosses show you the, the uh, recent assessment from IPCC relevant to New Zealand. And you can see in every case, there's a slight increase in the projections. So again, adaptive approach will help cope with this change. Also, I'm involved in an NZ Sea Rise project which is going to produce projections all around the coast at around 20 kilometer spacings around New Zealand. And that will include local vertical land movement to give localized projections of sea level rise for planning and adaptation. So in summary, we've got to focus on both mitigation of emissions and local adaptation. So we're going to do both hand in hand. The need for adaptation in our low-lying areas around New Zealand is certain because of that ongoing sea level rise, but what is uncertain is when we need to do that and how fast. So that's what we're going to work out at the local scale. And so adaptive approaches are best for dealing with that widening uncertainty rather than using a worst case or a best estimate or going too early or too late. And it better enables community and iwi hapu engagement and dialogue and planning out our future options. So I'll now hand the baton on to Glenn Stevens. Hi, I'm Glenn Stevens. I'm a senior resource scientist at Tasman District Council, specialising in uh, natural hazards. And so for my part of the presentation, I just want to give a recap of the coastal hazard mapping that we've undertaken and some of the risk assessment that we've done previously. So the coastal hazard mapping was publicly released in July 2019, and hopefully quite a few of you are familiar with this. Um, it's just a, a web-based map, but like Google Maps, and on that we've put a, a number of coastal hazards. Um, we've got coastal erosion, areas of low-lying land, and where known, we've put coastal protection structures that exist there.
And if we zoom in a little closer, in this here, we're looking at the Richmond Racecourse area, the AMP showgrounds. And this is an example of, how, of the mapping that we've done. In this example, we're showing a one metre sea level rise, and we've tied everything into the level of the sea. And so in the dark blue there, we can see this mean high water spring. So that's the mean or the average of the spring tides. In this example, like I said, we've shown a one metre sea level rise in the teal. And then on top of that, we've shown the 1% annual exceedance probability storm tide. And so the 1% AEP storm tide, that's just a combination of storm and tide that has the 1% probability of occurring in any given year. Not all storms are this big, storms come in a range of sizes, but we're just using this one as a sort of a reference storm. So this is a cross section of what we were looking at the map and we put this here just to try and help you understand what, what you're viewing when you look at the map. It's just a simple elevation model. It's based on the LIDAR um, digital elevation model that the council now has for around the coast. And we're just showing areas of land that would uh, at or below a particular reference level. And so you can see in the diagram here, we've got mean high water springs and again, the one meter sea level rise and the 1% AEP storm tide on top. And so the area this represents is what we, when we talk about vulnerable land close to the coast, we're talking about land like this. So this kind of simple elevation model has some limitations, but it's still a useful tool. And we're, we're certainly not the only council using this method. Some of the limitations are that it doesn't measure the severity of the hazard, it's just the presence of some hazard. And so that type of hazard and the severity will vary within the mapped area. For example, close to the coast, it's going to be quite a different hazard to those right at the inland margins. Another limitation is that it doesn't show wave run up. So that's the effect of large waves hitting the shore, surging up into even lifting water even higher. And I guess another limitation is probably the most important one I'd like you to sort of get your heads around and understand is it doesn't show the connectiveness of these low lying areas to the coast and that varies. And so some areas are going to be more protected inland and others are going to be more exposed at the coast. But these inland areas are still affected by sea level rise, such as stormwater ponding, high groundwater levels, whereas at the coastal areas, it's more likely to be inundation and erosion. So following the mapping, and in December 2020, we released our coastal um, risk assessment and for that, we looked at a number of elements at risk. And so these sorts of things include infrastructure, three waters, infrastructure, pipes, pumping stations, stormwater outfalls. We looked at land cover, Tasman resource management plan zones, we looked at numbers of buildings, heritage trees. These were all grouped into four value domains, and this is as prescribed by the MFE guidance. And these value domains being human, natural environment, economy, and the built environment. So with the risk, coastal risk assessment, we essentially took a, a GIS, a computer-based system, where we just essentially looked at the intersect of these various layers. So in the example here, we're showing land cover. And so what we've done is we've taken land cover, we've overlaid that with the hazard, and then we've sort of put the giant cookie cutter on and we've seen what the result in the area is. All of this risk assessment, we used the two meter sea level rise scenario. Once we've done that, we summed it rather than sum it up for the, just the whole district as a whole. We summed it up across seven representative areas of the coast and just to sort of get a, a relative um, assessment of the various attributes at risk there. So for this round of coastal and get, as I say, the, the risk assessments was, was reported in a report that you can get down available online. But for this round of coastal engagement, we've prepared the, a number of posters summarizing some of this data. We haven't got time to show you them all in this presentation. So we've just got one example here. So this one looks at the Tasman Resource Management Plan land use zones around the coast. And on the left-hand side, we've got the schematic there with the different size circles representing, I guess, the different quantities and different area. And so, some of the things that we can see here is that the Motueka Rewaka area is by far the most largest area of residential land. 
whereas in the Waimea, we've got quite a significant area of industrial commercial zone land. What the, the map on the left doesn't show is that around Tasman Bay and Golden Bay, just about the, the, the largest land use there is, is rural. And of that 84%, predominantly pasture, but there's some quite significant areas of horticulture in the, the Mutawaka, Rewaka and the Waimea areas as well. So, so from the other posters, there's a, a number of quick takeouts. There's plenty more that you can get if you dive into the data yourselves. But just uh, some examples, you know, close to eight and a half thousand people are living in with the slow lying vulnerable areas. Most of these are in the Mutueka area, also Mapua, and that combined is almost three quarters of the population in these vulnerable areas. Five and a half thousand so buildings. A lot of these will be connected to council infrastructure. Again, that's giving sort of an idea of the scale of infrastructure. 160 kilometres of roads in these low-lying vulnerable areas. And these can be particularly important where they connect communities or other places we value, such as national parks and, and just access to the coast. There's a lot of reserve land at the coast. Um, if we look at all the open space and recreation zone land across the entire district, 51% of that is in this area that's vulnerable to sea level rise, two metre sea level rise scenario. And of that 51%, just over half of it's vulnerable in a present day storm tide. But that's just a reflection of a lot of our reserves are at the coast. There's a lot of indigenous vegetation, not surprisingly, in the Abel Tasman National Park zone of the coast, there's, there's a lot of that. Archaeological sites, they're distributed all around and there's heritage building to protect the trees. And like I said, there's lots more detail. And so I urge you to sort of have a look at that and consider the things that you value. So at this point, I'd like to hand over to Diana, who's now going to talk about some of the options. Thanks, Glenn. So I'm now going to talk about the high level options, but I would encourage you to go onto our website where there's a lot more detail about these options and also a number of case studies that we've set out that shows that we are actually already doing a lot in the coastal management space around our district. So the options fall within four broad categories of accommodate, protect, avoid and retreat. And these, in many cases, are relevant to both existing development and new development. As we develop our long-term adaptive plan, it's likely we'll need a combination of options. And these can be thought of as short, medium, and long-term actions. The accommodate grouping of options looks at adjusting existing assets or designing new assets to anticipate the hazard risk. Examples include raising ground and floor levels. We already see this a lot as a mitigation option as part of resource and building consent processes. Another option is looking at requiring relocatable houses. We do have a few examples of this in the district already. Or providing alternative inundation pathways. And what we mean by that is an example or is, say for example, canal development. And this photo here shows an example of a building that has a raised floor level, but it's also relocatable. And this black pavilion house is located on the Moturi Estuary near the turn off to Tasman village and featured on grand designs back in 2017. The protect grouping of options essentially hold the line and they protect coastal areas and existing development and infrastructure from the sea. In terms of these options, it signals that we're prepared to invest to protect an area for longer, but this can only be thought of as a short to medium term action and we'll need other options as part of our coastal management at some point in the future. These protect options can fall into two categories. We've got soft protection. This photo here is an example of beach replenishment at Torrent Bay in Abel Tasman National Park, and also hard protection measures. And this photo is of the Maraho Sea Wall, which protects the road behind and adjoining houses and businesses. In terms of soft protection measures, these enable protection and restoration of coastal habitats and also enable ongoing access and recreational opportunities along the coast. However, in relation to hard protection measures, this, these can cause significant adverse effects 
And this is because just of the inherent nature of hard protection measures, which ultimately interfere with natural coastal processes. In relation to the avoid grouping, this looks at to stop putting more people and assets in harm's way, primarily using land use planning measures. It's very much thought of, of let's not make the situation worse approach. We've got two examples of avoidance strategies within our district. In terms of the Mapua Ruby Bay area, our Tasman Resource Management Plan identifies a coastal risk area, which restricts further intensification of development in that low-lying coastal area, and instead seeks to put and directs new housing opportunities to the hills behind, away from that hazard-prone coastline. And our other example is the Nelson Tasman Future Development Strategy, which was adopted in July 2019. This strategy identifies new housing and business land opportunities in our district for the next 30 years. And as we assessed sites, we ensured that these development opportunities were not located in low-lying coastal hazard-prone areas. Our last option is retreat, and that looks at moving existing people and assets away from the coast and the coastal processes that threaten them. In terms of retreat, it can be small scale. So for example, just moving a building back on its site to a whole scale movement and retreat of coastal communities and infrastructure or others such as ecological migration to enable new coastal habitats and protect species. Without a doubt, the retreat option is incredibly complex and central government signaled through the RMA reform that they'll be addressing issues around this. Within our district, the Motueka Wastewater Treatment Plant is an example of council's work for planning for the managed retreat of a council-owned infrastructure asset. To, so to sum up in terms of where we're at with the coastal management project, over the last couple of years, we've done our coastal hazard and sea level rise mapping. We've released our risk assessment, and we're now looking at those high, high level options for coastal management. Going forward, our next steps will be to look at that local level work, to work with our communities around what are the realistic coastal management options. But before we can do that, we need to await the outcomes of the RMA reform and also central government's work around the National Adaptation Plan, which is due in August 2022. This is because these two key pieces of work will have significant implications on our work around coastal management. Thank you, Diana. Um, and thank you as well uh, to, to Rob and Glenn for your presentations there. So. At this stage, I'd like to um, signal that we are seeking your feedback and ideas. So it's really important as part of this coastal management project that we hear from the community. Um, we need to understand your views on those broad options and also any alternative ideas for coastal management that you'd like the team to consider. So they may be local ideas um, in regards to um, how we adapt to sea level rise and coastal hazards, or you may be thinking more broadly um, across the district. The best way to give us feedback is to visit the council's website. So on the Tasman District Council website, there's a coastal management project page, which has a lot of information, a lot more detail about the broad options, um, and also a link to the feedback form um, where you can give us um, your, your detailed views. If you're short on time and just wanna share some quick ideas and views with us um, and the wider community, we also have a coastal management community conversations tool. Uh, again, you can access this through the Tasman District Council website. There's a link through to the tool um, there on the coastal management project page. Uh, we're taking feedback until the 15th of October. Um, so there's still a couple of weeks to uh, explore all the material that we've got online um, and have your say. The feedback that we gather um, are the over the next uh, few weeks will inform the next steps for this project um, as we sort of prepare for, for looking a little more locally um, at a granular level and consider, you know, which options, um, you know, delve a little bit deeper into the options um, and consider combinations and staging of options over time. So we now reached 
the end of our more formal presentations and we're into the questions and answers session. So thank you to everyone who's been using the questions and answers tool um, as part of this webinar. So just a reminder that the Q&A button um, to ask a question, if you wiggle your mouse, would be at the bottom of your screen. You can click on the Q&A with the two chat bubbles. It'll open up a window and you can pop your question in there. They come through to me um, and then I'm going to put them to our panellists now. Um, just to let you know, a couple of people are using the chat as well. Um, the chat is, I, I'm not monitoring the chat as closely as I am the Q&A, so welcome to use the chat. But the other difficulty of the chat is it doesn't save after the session, so we can't email you um, just in case we're not able to get through all the questions tonight. Um, so we do prefer that you use the Q&A tool. Um, but if we get through all the questions and answers, I'll go back and check the chat. All right, so first question is from Deb, so thank you, Deb. Does the Tasman District have any at-risk old dump or landfill sites under threat from rising sea levels? And that's a really great question. Um, I'm aware, I think from the from the work that um, Glenn was talking about with the what's at risk, there are eight um, across the district um, dotted along the coast. But Glenn, can you tell us any more about, about those sites? Not a lot more other than that they're known to council, um, our engineering section, look after them, they're monitored periodically, and so there's certainly no one keeping an eye on what's happening to them. Um, like I said, there was eight, um, there may well be others that we don't know about, so we can't discount that. So if you know of any, please let us know. Thanks, Glenn. Um, a question from Tim about the Wymere West developments, residential and commercial, um, and he says it's a glaring emission. So um, some concerns there about the Wymere West development. Diana, are you able to talk to us about what's going on there, what we know. So I think that's in reference to what's known as the Richmond West development area. Um, and there's an awful lot of new housing going on down in there. Um, certainly in terms of if you actually go online and have a look at the mapping, that housing development is outside the, um, the map extent of that two meter sea level rise. Um, I think it's a bit of a misconception uh, in terms of ground levels in, in Richmond and what it looks like. Um, Glenn, uh, Glenn, I don't know if you want to um, add in anything further there? No, you've pretty much nailed it um, on the head there. Um, the land levels there are typically sort of six, seven, eight metres relative to the datum, which makes them a, a bit, a, a about you know five and a half to six metres above mean high water springs at present. So yeah, like Diana said, outside of that two metre sea level rise. Um, Rob, we've had a question come in from someone named John, who's interested in how intergenerational investment choices and trade-offs we handled and prioritised. So can you talk to us a bit more maybe about the staging over time and when and where investment needs to be made? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And, you know, we, we have to think of our future generations, um, particularly in Māori, they, they think long-term as well. So the adaptive approach, well, the conventional approach of just taking a worst case or taking a punt and then putting in the option right now when we may not need it for a while. So the adaptive approach says, well, we might have to put in a short term action, maybe just to buy time. Uh, and then at 0.4 meters or 0.6 meter sea level rise, we go to another option in the suite that Diana talked about. So that at that point, it allows future generations, the young ones, uh, more people who have moved into the region to have a say as well as to do we go with option B or C at that junction. So adaptive planning maps it all out for the next hundred years, but it's not set in concrete. Uh, it, you monitor and if sea level rise slows down, then you don't have to uh, implement the plan so quickly, but if sea level rise speeds up, then we have to bring the, the planning forward. So that's how adaptive planning works and it allows future preferences to be included. Thanks, Rob. Um, a question about what we're currently doing. Um, so in terms of council's current um, planning restrictions, um, we've had a question, what height above sea level are you restricting new housing to? For example, at a current level of three metres above sea level, are new houses allowed to be planned for? Um, so Diana, can you tell us what's the, what's the current um, situation there across the district? 
I might jump in there, and it might be a better place to answer that. So we have our inundation practice notice, and that requires for, for housing, you to allow for a one year sea level rise, plus storm tide, and then a freeboard is for a margin of error. Subdivision, it's one and a half metres of sea level rise. Other buildings for lesser importance or shorter duration, a lower sea level rise would be considered. Um, a, a question of clarification really um, from Isabel, who's asked, why do we say protection is just a short or medium term measure? Um, the Dutch have been doing it for hundreds of years. So why are we looking at protection there as a short to medium term measure? Glenn, is that something you can talk to a little bit more about protection? I'm hoping Dr. Bell might want to take this one off. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of um, sort of dissimilarities between the Dutch. So it's a small country, has millions of people, uh, and so they have an existential threat that they've been facing for a century or two. Um, so they have a lot of resource that goes into um, coastal protection, but of late they've been doing what they call a sand engine using soft um, engineering to build up the beaches rather than build up the walls. Um, for New Zealand, um, it just wouldn't be economic other than probably in our CBD areas to keep building the walls up because even if we get our emissions globally down to the Paris Agreement type level of one and a half to two degrees warming, we're still going to see ultimately sea levels of one to one and a half meters. So the cutting the emissions helps slow the pace of that, but we're still not going to be able to, I, in my view, uh, have sea walls maintained uh, and built to that sort of height and that sort of sea level rise ongoing. So it's a, to me, it's a short to medium term option. Um, a question that may also be for you, Rob, around the, the question of cost. Who pays? Where does the burden fall? So David's asked, does the cost of measures fall entirely to the local authority? So that is Tasman District Council in our case. Um, so and I know there's a lot of conversation going on um, at a national level as well. There's a lot of work going on with the Ministry for the Environment. So can you talk to us about um, yeah, the question of the burden of cost? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, it, it's these questions around who plays and who pays are, are very relevant. I've been involved in the Hawke's Bay uh, adaptive planning uh, over the last five years. And so they've got to a point and they're stalled to some degree around the funding issue. So who is it going to be targeted rates? Is it regional council, district council, um, general rates, central government? So what what's the quantum in the size of the pot. Uh, and so that's got to a stalemate. And we're really, we're waiting for the resource management reforms, particularly the Climate Change Adaptation Act, which uh, has already started to formulate some ideas around how you might fund and fund these kind of adaptation options across New Zealand. So yes, a, a very relevant question, um, but I, Without a doubt, I think it's going to be a cost-sharing arrangement. Um, as long as there's some statutory test probably around moral hazards, so not bailing out people who probably bought in the last year or two knowing sea level rise was well on the way compared with people who bought decades ago and before sea level rise was even talked about. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Glenn. In terms of um, the impact of salination on the water tables, so we're, we're talking here about you know impacts of rising sea levels on brown water. Are we doing any modelling in coastal um, horticultural or pastoral land? A question there from Debbie. Um, Council does have groundwater models for the main aquifers, and certainly the scenarios do look at seawater intrusion, generally from the point of view of pumping or over pumping but in a sense, a rising sea level is going to mimic that effect or exacerbate it. And so there's a question of balancing abstraction with, I guess, with, 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 with what's available in the aquifer. And so whilst we haven't modelled it specifically for sea level rise, um, it's certainly something that we're aware of and, and mindful of. And, and the coastal aquifers, the shallower ones, often don't get used a lot, but they're very important for the people that do use them. Thank you. 
Um, Rob, a question that speaks really nicely to you in New Zealand, um, Sea Rise Project. Um, is the land mass in this area rising, falling or static? So what have we got going on in terms of that vertical movement in the, in the Tasman district? So vertical land movement around New Zealand, um, we've found from our recent findings is quite localised in different places, particularly where we've got sediment basins at river deltas, they tend to subside. Um, but generally around the Tasman district, it looks like there's some small subsidence, which is just going to make sea level rise slightly higher than it would be if, if it was stable. Uh, whereas other areas, um, Wellington in particular, Wellington south, the south of the North Island is going down at two or three millimetres a year. So they're going to face even higher sea level rises from that vertical land movement. But if you have uplift, um, certainly as Kaikoura uh, has experienced uh, from an earthquake event, you know, they, they won't be in the adaptation game uh, anytime soon. The Waimea Flaxmore Fault does present a bit of a hazard there in the sense that the Mooch depressions, the down throw inside, um, you know, we're not sure exactly, but we can, we can assume that there'll be some, I guess, subsidence following an earthquake if that ruptures. Um, the time, I mean, that time frames that that might rupture, it's, it's difficult to plan for, but it's certainly something that we need to be aware of. Thanks. Um the decision around whether to use soft or hard protection um, options when encountering sea level rise and erosion, um, is there a criteria that we might look to employ or what are some of the factors that you might think about um, when deciding whether soft or hard protection might be appropriate? Diana, can you talk to us about that and maybe just tell us a bit in terms of the national guidance from a coastal policy statement um, on that? Yeah, Nicole, it's very much a case of we can look at that national direction through the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. Um, and it's framed in a way where it gives preference to natural buffers and soft protection measures um, rather than the use of hard protection. It, it dis discourages hard protection in many circumstances, um, but it does recognise, I think it's policy 27, um, that hard protection measures may be required to protect existing infrastructure of national and regional importance. And so examples of that would be, say, ports, airports, um, things like that. Um, and where did non-physical, where does non-physical infrastructure, so sports grounds, golf courses, all those kind of um, I guess open spaces, recreational areas, how do they fit um, into the plan? And what do we know about, you know, I guess, how, how much of... Um, those valued places are at risk? Um, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, you know, certainly at a local level, say if somebody in the community wanted to uh, put forward an, an option around uh, to protect some of those areas, um, you know, certainly we still have to work within our resource management plan uh, guidance and the Tasman resource management plan. Um, so certainly you'd have to go through a consenting framework there that provides further, further guidance around what that criteria may be. But certainly in terms of thinking around land uses, things like open space and recreation is actually a really good short term use um, of an area thinking about that longer term sea level rise because historically where council has put in hard protection structures that has been to address the immediate uh, coastal erosion hazard risk and it doesn't protect that inundation and longer term sea level rise. So that sort of um, speaks to another question that we had in just around how long do those, those hard protections last? So if you had to build a, a, some sort of rock wall, what would you expect the lifespan of something like that to be? Glenn, have you got any sort of, or, or Rob? Uh, maybe if I jump in there um, yeah. as a coastal engineer. So a lot of our sea walls or rock revetments, they can be concrete or rocks uh, typically, you know, they're engineered structures. So as sea level rises, the, the footprint has to be much wider. The foundations have to go deeper. And so they become highly engineered um, structures that will be required to withstand higher sea level rises as well as the wave run-up that Glenn talked about. So um, 
and and then the adverse effects really will take over with the loss of the intertidal beach and so on. And Diana's just made a good point as well. So often they're used for coastal erosion. Um, as sea level rises, coastal erosion will remain a localised problem. It will get worse, but it'll be localised. But coastal hazards will begin to be dominated by coastal flooding. And so seawalls, rock revetments are not that useful uh, or as they don't have the utility to do both coastal erosion and coastal flooding, um, particularly with wave overtopping and groundwater coming in through the bottom. Thanks, Rob. Um, in terms of limbs, the role of limbs in all of this, um, so Glenn, can you advise what areas have flooding notations on their limbs? Um, and also, do we have any properties noting land instability mapping? So um, Ken here is referencing um, some of the work that Nelson City Council are undertaking. Um, so what are we looking at in terms of um, limbs for the Tasman district? Well, council's obliged to disclose any hazard information that holds on a limb for a particular property. And that's what council, Tasman does um, and has done for quite some time. And so, yeah, any of these coastal properties, we will note the proximity to the coast and they note the, the level of the land now that we have that off the LIDAR. Um, but generally, this doesn't come as a surprise to people in that they know these are coastal properties, they're known to be low lying. Um, in terms of insurance and how that affects that, well, again, insurance are, are very attuned to coastal hazards. They probably know as much, if not more, than we do about, about these hazard areas. And so they're well aware of the coastal properties and they'll make their own decisions on that. Um, but, but yeah, certainly limbs, it's, uh, the hazards noted, um, like any hazard, council has information on. Thanks, Glenn. Um, we've had a couple of kind of questions slash comments around um, the situation in Motueka. So Ross has put forward that how can we factor in that a town like Motueka is more than account is is more than than the rest of the district at risk in terms of people and assets and homes and, and social structures. Um, so given this and, and how much is at risk that we value, how might that assist our thinking and comfort with investing um, in protection measures, even if we're thinking interim measures? So, um, and, and a similar question um, from Isabel, who's a decision looking at the models, um, a great amount of the town is, is, is potentially affected by sea level rise. Um, and so, you know, there's a view there that protection um, needs to be part of the picture. But Diana, how would we go about thinking about this, you know, we've got these four broad options. How do we go about thinking about what might be right, um, especially for, for Motueka, where we have got um, such a, a great number of, of people, buildings, um, and other values um, at risk? Yeah, I mean, certainly if you look at the mapping and you look at the outputs of the risk assessment, it's very much signalling that Motueka is by far our largest township in the district, which will be affected by rising sea levels over time. Um, Certainly, uh, where we're at in the project currently is, you know, we've done that map and we've done the risk assessment work, and now we're just starting to understand in terms of broader what are our options across the region. Um, so it'll probably be that next step in the project where we start to look at the local level options and have those discussions with our communities. But certainly council as a whole is, you know, aware of the situation more to work in some of our um, infrastructure decisions considering, um, you know, the long lifetimes that they cover, which I discussed um, early on in the presentation, we're, we're aware of the issues and, you know, it's starting to be embedded within our um, council's infrastructure activity management plans, that consideration around sea level rise. Cool. So very much a case of engage with this, check out the mapping, check out what's yeah. at risk, get really familiar with it, have your say on these broad options, um, mm -hmm. and then look out for um, the next stage of this project when we will be coming in and looking at a more local level. That's right, yeah. Cool. Um, Fiona has asked about strategies around future development um, to avoid low um, laying coastal areas. Um, but are we also factoring in um, with climate change more frequent um, storms and, and perhaps heavier rainfall, um, stormwater holding areas, are they being built into our future planning? Um, 
what's happening in terms of some of those um, more extreme events and, and how does that fit into some of our, our planning? Um, I guess we're talking about the future development strategy. There are other things as well, um, things like the Tasman Environment Plan, Aruri Kuta, Aruri Kitai, that um, the council is is currently working on. Um, so Diana, can you talk about some of um, those things and then maybe Glenn, if you want to jump in about what else council um, is doing to, to factor in future hazards? Yeah, so broadly, um, Council has started the review of our resource management plan and that second generation plan, the Tasman Environment Plan, uh, will look at the natural hazards and climate change impacts as a whole. So we're currently in the process of reviewing a lot of our technical information around natural hazards at the moment. Um, and certainly that will be used to inform future land use um, and zoning uh, rule framework that we'll see within that part plan which will direct where our future growth opportunities will go um, and certainly you know I encourage you to jump onto the website uh, have a look at that plan review process um, and get involved because in terms of the plan review it will take a number of years um, and you know we will have those ongoing conversations with the community around you know where do we want to see growth um, being directed and as Nicole said um, council is just starting to also review the future development strategy and there are actually um, a number of community webinars which are starting next week to talk about that work program and so I'd encourage you to register for one of those webinars too and you can go onto our website to find out more details on that work program. Thanks Diana. Um, so we are due to wrap up at 8pm but we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, so a question around um, as, as you're moving through all of this, this work and planning, um, are we going to seek advice from qualified experts um, in experienced in hard defences from world leaders in the field? So namely from the Netherlands, but just across the board, um, where else are we looking when we're doing this work um, and, and what sort of other expertise are we seeking? Um, Diana? Yeah, and I mean, certainly that's why we've got Dr. Dr. Rob Bell online with us. Um, he's providing his expertise as a, a leading coastal scientist across New Zealand. And, you know, certainly if we don't have that in-house expertise, we can look elsewhere. And, you know, counts, coastal councils around New Zealand are working together and sharing information and knowledge as we all work through this work program. I think it's really important to stress that while this coastal management project is Tasman's work, things around climate change and sea level rise is a national issue and nationally we have to work together. Thanks, Anna. Yeah, maybe if I jump in there too, uh, just to make the point uh, that the adaptive approach that we've built into the Ministry for the Environment Coastal Guidance, uh, we worked very collaboratively with the Dutch. Uh, that's where that concept of adaptive planning, dynamic adaptive planning was born. So uh, we are borrowing uh, and working with the Dutch quite closely uh, in this space. Thanks, Rob. Um, the question around, I guess, the role of um, capitalism in all of this. Um, and so, Richard, I will speak to it, I will ask. Um, so I guess what, what Richard is driving at is um, our current kind of growth model in which we operate. Um, it's pretty tricky um, in terms of managing emissions. So it sits quite squarely in the mitigation space um, and, and bearing in mind that we are really hoping to talk adaptation um, through this. But I wonder, Rob, have you got any comments around um, kind of how we can adapt while also bearing in mind that we are in um, the, this current um, paradigm way of thinking um, with, with capitalism and growth at the moment. Yeah, no, that it, it's a tough one. Um, but I would stress, you know, we have to deal with the system we've got at the moment because around New Zealand, and I'm sure there are spots in the Tasman like we're, we're imminently at adaptation threshold. So I've been working at Holmoana. There are a lot of areas around New Zealand that really need to adapt in the next two or three decades and get some serious options in place and paid for. Someone has to pay for it. So already uh, under our current economic planning system, we still have to put the pressure on uh, to make sure we're not increasing the risk uh, from our planning decisions um, before we get some RMA reform and maybe some other 
economic reform after that. Thanks, Rob. Um, we are really at time, but there is one really important question come through that I would like to see us um, address, which is around insurance um, and retreat. And how do we see all of that panning out? Because I think that is something that's um, a concern on people's mind. And, and it is, as Diana explained, the retreat option is really complex. Um, so, Diana, can you just maybe speak a little bit more about retreat? Um, and then Rob will go to you just to speak to insurance. And then we will have to wrap up the questions and answers. But please do remember that we have a number of feedback channels. Go to the Tasman District Council website. Um, I really urge you to have your say on this um, because it will be really valuable as we move into the next stages of the project. All right. So, Diana, retreat. Um, you know, in, in terms of retreat, yes, it is incredibly complex um, for society as a whole in terms of how we will look to do this. Um, but, but certainly where retreat is identified as being the best option, I imagine that would be a longer term option. However, we need to start putting some of those processes in place sooner rather than later um, because it will be very complicated and technical. Thanks. Rob? Yeah, no, I agree. Um, it's better to be preemptive and proactive about managed retreat. Um, and that may take decades to plan uh, to set aside new development areas um, rather than a reactive managed retreat where you get a major event that causes a lot of damage. And then you've got to ask yourself the question, do we build back better or somewhere else? And so under the heat of the moment, so it's far better to do some city and or some rural or whatever, and work your way through um, over decades to get to that end point. In terms of insurance, uh, once an area becomes more um, subject and vulnerable to more frequent flooding, uh, particularly when you have events that might occur every few years, then insurance will look uh, very closely at that because they won't ensure situations that are certain to occur. So they are only ensure at an annual cycle uh, for rare events. So if things are becoming more common, um, they may look at excesses and, and withdrawal. But the key here with adaptive planning is that we can get all the people in the room, take a systems approach, get councils, get insurers, bankers, uh, infrastructure providers working together on sustainable solutions as, you know, and they can come from the four categories that Diana's talked about. Great. Thanks, Rob. Um, so we do sort of draw to a close now. Um, so just here we go as a reminder, there is the web address um, to go there directly or just Google Tasman District Council Coastal Management um, and you'll, you'll find the project. Um, you can also flick us an email um, and remember that there is that feedback form um, and the conversation tool.